the People's Republic of China, evoking the past, summoning the future, doing the unexpected. As a nation only 30 years old, but every decade since its founding, a surprising turn or two. In relationships with the outside world, and developments within. Now, suddenly, we have a new set of East-West relationships. To begin to understand, you've got to see China from the inside. people, almost a billion Chinese, two-thirds under 30 years old. The changes, a political, economic, and social ferment. And for NBC News, a unique opportunity. We've just spent two months in China, and our film offers an inside view of the world's most populous, often bewildering nation a nation that remains in a class by itself. A world apart. Remote and aloof for thousands of years. Until now. Even as the People's Republic, China remained isolated most of the time. Its dramatic, far-reaching cultural revolution was a revolution behind closed doors. Briefly, an opening for an unlikely visitor. Then, once more, a China preoccupied with itself. Its political problems, an internal affair. Foreigners not welcome. Even one of the worst earthquakes in history, killing 600,000, was nobody else's business. The death of Premier Zhou Enlai and of Chairman Mao himself reported reluctantly, filtered carefully to the outside world. Suddenly, a dramatic announcement by President Carter, normalization of relations with China. The president said, we recognize simple reality. China and the United States to exchange ambassadors, to open embassies in each other's capitals. One of the reasons this came about is the enormous change that's taken place in China and its foreign policy, as well as inside the country. Changes instigated by Deng Xiaoping. There is today a new mood, an openness, optimism. Wage increases, more consumer goods, production goals, even personal ambitions for a people tiring of political campaigns. Less suspicion of each other and of outsiders. In fact, a China open to foreigners. especially to those the Chinese had been taught to hate. Americans, Japanese, 
many Europeans. Soon, foreign visitors will be welcome in nearly all of China. This hospitality, is it politically motivated? It seems almost impolite to ask. The openness is contrary to Mao's call for self-reliance. Go it alone, do it alone, all alone. Self-reliance had been a basic part of China's ideology, making its own machines, feeding and clothing its own people, staying out of debt to foreigners, and without outside help, almost wiping out hunger and illiteracy. But self-reliance goes only so far. China has reached a plateau. The Chinese leadership admits that China's science and technology must have help. The nation's industrial growth depends on iron and steel. By 1985, 10 new complexes are planned with foreign help. For its various industries, China has made deals to buy equipment and technology worth billions of dollars from Europe, Japan, and the United States, all in the past few months. The priority is on high technology industry. Oil, for example. Chinese oil, and there seems to be a lot of it, will be sold for foreign currency, with which to buy more foreign technology. China may be a world power, but its hardware belongs to the third world. Industry far behind the advanced nations. Military weapons lagging. Agriculture, in some places, almost primitive falling behind the Soviet Union. That fear of the unfriendly neighbor is also fueling the drive for modernization. As usual, politics ties in with economics. The leadership is determined to make China a modern power by the year 2000. Modernization is now the state's highest goal. And to modernize, the leadership is depending on science and technology. The nation's top leaders at the National Science Congress, including Vice Premier Fang Yi, who's also the Minister of Science and Technology, and Senior Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping. Chinese年中出現了在外科學,學習科學的新風向,一個想科學技術現代化進行的熱潮,正在全國尋夢興起,等我們前,展開了光明燦爛的前景。it's obvious that modernization cannot be separated from education. As we acquire new technology, we must have people with the proper training to handle it. We are following the final wishes of Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou to complete the task of modernization by the end of the century. And when that time comes, China will approach or catch up with or even surpass the advanced nations of the world. Education, science and technology, modernization. They make up the link that's now the highest order of politics in China to us by the year 2000. China's assets and problems are its people. Today, more than 220 million in classrooms, in schools emphasizing science and technology. If China gets its act together, 
and its people together, it can change the world in our lifetime. There's a permanence about China and almost constant change. This curious contradiction has always been part of Chinese society, a people who learn to cope with contradictions. A contradiction, for example, in the approach to education. During the Cultural Revolution, a policy of education for the masses and a lowering of standards. Today, the raising of standards, an emphasis on learning that embraces every age, from kindergarten to college postgraduates. Education in China is enormously important maybe more so than anywhere else in the world today. Last spring, Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping made a speech on education, an important policy statement. In it, he related education to science, technology, the modernization of the country. That speech is still being discussed all over China, in all of the provinces, in the cities, communes, and factories, and from the universities down to the primary schools. A kind of single-mindedness unimaginable in the United States. Can you imagine, can you picture a speech on education by an American vice president that will be talked about in all the schools in all 50 states half a year later? Well, here, education is having that kind of impact. Learning is celebrated. Today's slogan is quality education rather than class struggle, the slogan of the Cultural Revolution. Going to school is an auspicious occasion marked by welcoming ceremonies for new students. Peking University. At universities, the notion of the academic elite is creeping back in. The poor and underprivileged are no longer favored for admission. His father and said, my lord, I love a sheep's daughter, and I would have her for my wife. Once again, education is competitive and rigorous. The president of Peking University, Dr. Zhou Pei Yuan, a physicist, educated in the United States. His goal is to more than double the enrollment to 20,000 in six years. One thing, it's not only with our university, or other universities in China have to increase their enrollment. That's one thing. The second is we have to, we have to elevate the scientific level of the new students through entrance examination. School entrance examinations, eliminated during the Cultural Revolution, are back for secondary schools as well as for colleges. This high school, coaching sessions are held four nights a week to prepare students for college exams, to be given more than half a year later. Competitive? Well, this past year, nationally, one in 20 applicants was enrolled. Some schools now are designated as model schools, almost all of them in cities. They're called key schools. They get more funds, better equipment, better teachers. Students must pass stiff examinations to get in. All this is part of a crash project to train 800,000 scientists and engineers by 1985. All my expectations depend on one person. 
and how indefinite and vague they are. Chinese students and scholars are starting to go abroad, many to the United States, now by the hundreds, later by the thousands. What does the word expectations mean? I think your expectation means the heritage. Mm. Mm. Come Yao, would you please read? Yao Yu Sheng majors in English. For him, a promising future as an interpreter or translator. To the town, and arrived there late. The friendship between our countries uh, is growing daily, and I think uh, we can use English as the means of communication to strengthen the friendship. And we must learn the advanced technology of foreign countries, and English is very useful. A married princess. Very good. Very good indeed. Then what does the expression as good as mean? It means nearly, almost. Nearly. That's right. She had almost adopted me. And it, it could not fail to be her intention to bring us together. This is the third class for lesson 38. During the spring festival... The recent decision to popularize the study of foreign languages was made at the highest level. They're now part of the popular culture. He was almost home. The popularization of science, too, goes beyond the traditional classroom. It also is a part of the culture of contemporary China. And a part of the ideology. A new long march. A new great leap toward modernization. It's patriotic to be a scientist or an engineer, fitting in neatly with the individual dream to go to a key university. Some dreams are realized. Chang Hai Dao, a 14-year-old mathematics student at Peking University, chosen because of his high score in the entrance examinations, chosen for his intellect. A far cry from the preceding anti-intellectual period called the lost decade of the Cultural Revolution. Research stifled, study discouraged, libraries wrecked, fighting. Teachers were called stinking bourgeois intellectuals. 80% of Peking University's professors were punished. One of them, Professor Chu Da Si, only recently rehabilitated. They declared that I am a reactionary professor and put me to, to do some labor work, such as to, to repair the boilers, uh, carpentry work, and agricultural work in the fields. Professor, were other teachers and professors treated worse? Some of my colleagues, they were worse treated. Uh, a few of them uh, died of illness, and some of them uh, were put to torture to get confession. They suffered badly then. The Cultural Revolution, a period of chaos and violence, that closed schools at first, then changed the aims of education. In colleges, an open admissions policy, favoring poor peasants, workers, and soldiers. The turmoil spread to many cities, many campuses. Student Red Guard factions fought each other, each side in the name of Chairman Mao. Xiao Ling, principal of a technical college in Shenyang City, did something unprecedented for us. On a tour of the campus, he told us the grim details of what happened here during the Cultural Revolution. You can still see the physical damage to the campus. Xiao Ling said there were no classes for four years. The campus was turned into a battleground. One student was killed by a grenade. A park-like area where students once studied. 
The concrete benches and tables were torn apart and used as barricades and weapons. At the campus square, a mini war with rifles and machine guns. You can still see the bullet holes. It's fashionable in China these days to criticize the Cultural Revolution, skimming over the positive accomplishments of the period, when basic education was spread throughout the countryside and health care was introduced in many remote areas. Years of populism, when peasants and poor workers were elevated on the social scale. Those accomplishments are now played down. There's another tendency today to blur that period of the Cultural Revolution with the succeeding period, known as the Years of the Gang of Four, which ended with their arrest in 1976. The Gang of Four, Chang Ching, Chairman Mao's wife. Chang Chung Chow, political theorist, then vice premier. Wang Hung Wen, a mill worker who rose to power. Yao Wen Yuan, a journalist whose article was a fuse for the Cultural Revolution. When the Gang of Four ran rampant, our educational system was damaged severely. Students did nothing but fight. Schools are for studying. The sabotage by the Gang of Four has definitely set back the education of our young people. They took the education uh, as a tool to, 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 to get some propaganda benefit. They had many slogans, many opinions about the education. But really, they are not... Uh, uh, dest they destroyed the education. They do, no they do nothing good for education. They destroy the, the education. Education, if not destroyed, was at least in a sorry state. And the Gang of Four is used today as a convenient scapegoat, blamed for low academic performance, for classes that were unattended, and the reading rooms that were unused. Those same reading rooms that are teeming with students today. The bookstores, too, are jammed. The scholar, of course, belongs to an ancient Chinese tradition. The Maoist tradition was an attempt to erase any elitist intellectual distinction. Ever since the founding of the People's Republic, there have been currents and cross-currents in China. The movement to modernize the country, running against attempts to break down the various classes in Chinese society. The need for highly educated scientists and technocrats at cross purposes with an ideal of education for the masses. Now again, the tide has turned. Modernization has become the policy, one that's hoped will turn China into a modern power by the year 2000. The pressures for modernization are moving against populism. Hopes for equality are put off. There are signs already of a three-tier society. The party official and the city intellectual, teacher, scientist, technocrat at the top. The urban industrial worker, today skills more generously rewarded, the future brighter. At the bottom, the peasant. Only patience, respect for authority, and patriotism might lead the peasant to accept this position, to believe that for modernization, others must go ahead. In China, there is a disadvantaged majority, the peasants. Not long ago, the life of the peasant was tragic. Now, it's simply very hard. 80% of Qin lives in the countryside, producing basic needs such as food and In a modernizing economy, the peasants bear the burden of industrial. 
providing two for the expanding cities. But when there aren't enough jobs in the cities, the countryside is the giant sponge taking in the excess labor force. In China, 12 million educated young people will have been relocated from the cities into the harsh environment of the farms and rural factories. How does it compare with city life? Well, there are about 12 million educated young people who can answer that question. During the 1960s and 70s, about that number, 12 million, were sent by the government from the city to the farms and communes. Many of them sent far away from home, many of them for the rest of their lives. That city to countryside exodus continues, but the government seems to be thinking it over, reappraising it. Will that program continue, and will it continue on the scale that it has been operating on for the past few years? You mean our program of sending young intellectuals to the countryside? Well, yes. That helped to raise the standards of rural areas. And also, it made young people from the city tougher, working with farmers. But with modernization, more workers will be needed for heavy industry and for the service trades. So, the number of young people to be sent to the countryside from now on will have to be modified, to be readjusted from year to year. The relocation of city youths is unpopular. The government is cutting back on the program but it won't help those already sent down. These high school graduates were sent from the city to the countryside in Honan province. They want to continue their education, but they aren't hopeful. We're all eager to go to college, of course, but we're also embarrassed. Because of the gang of four, our educational level is so low that we're not well prepared for the examinations. After class, we must read and read the new words and expressions over and over again. The countryside becomes the repository of low academic achievers. Those sent down from the city and those who can't leave the countryside. Lu Tzu Xia in her final year at the junior high school in the commune, hoping, like so many others, to get away to a big city university. I'll be graduating soon from junior high school, so I'll have to study hard to pass the examinations to get into high school. My highest aim is to go to college. I want to go to Xinhua University. I'd like to study physics. To escape from the daily grind, work and study, but mostly work. The ideal of the Cultural Revolution observed more today on the communes than in the cities. Wei Chung Ho is in his final year at the commune's middle school, or as we call it, high school. He's had almost 10 years of education, his father had only two. But Ken Wei continue his education. He wants to study science at a university in Shanghai. But university places are extremely limited. How is he going to compete with students like these at a key middle school in Peking? Many children of college-educated professionals. The chances of students at this school getting into college are 10 times better than for Wei and the rest of the senior middle school students in his rural province. Schools in the countryside simply are inferior in facilities, teachers, equipment, and funds. Our chances of getting into universities are not as good as for students from the city. Can you tell me why you think that students in the countryside have a harder time getting into university than students in the city? It's because of the conditions here. 
the basic courses, I guess. Because of that, we don't have as much knowledge as the students from the cities. Does it, does it worry you, does it make you nervous to think about taking a competitive examination for university? I won't worry about it much. If I don't pass, I'll settle down in the country and work. Yang Cheng Shun wants to study in a city university to be a scientist. Well, I'll study to try to pass the examinations. But if I don't pass, I can stay here and take part in productive labor. If I don't pass the examinations, I'll stay in the side for the rest of my life. Dreams tempered by resignation. The Maoist virtues are not forgotten in the countryside. Combine theory with practice. Have scholars toil with their hands. Here, the Maoist work ethic and patriotism are glorified. Young pioneers recite their pledge to study diligently, obey discipline, love labor, and to devote themselves to modernizing China. At the Kariko Mumita of the Chinese Revolution, the Palestinian committee, headed by Komida Hua Guofeng, smashed the, the gun all four and saved the revolution and the party. In classrooms, the lessons confirm the values of the larger society. This kind of moral teaching gets heavier play in the countryside, by which we mean most of China. Let me try. We are loyal to Qin Mao's revolutionary line. This is a middle school English text. Our school party branch firmly carries out Chairman Mao's May 7th directive. The class struggle is our main subject. We take an active part in the three great revolutionary movements. After graduation, the pupils will be new type peasants. But generations of Americans were brought up along similar Spartan puritanical lines. You are placed in this world to improve your time. You must be preparing for future usefulness. And if you do not improve the advantages you enjoy, you sin against your maker. That from the McGuffey Reader, a standard American school text at the turn of the century. More than 700 million Chinese peasants still seem to live in an earlier age and are taught to expect change more slowly. They're told that things used to be worse. That through the wisdom of the leadership, everything will work out for the best. For city industrial workers, life is improving. Fatter paychecks and other benefits, such as good free medical care. Living quarters are getting better. New apartments with rents under $3 a month. Store shelves are better stocked. More variety. Now the workers have money to shop and more places to visit, things to do. These days the mood is upbeat, the tempo faster. In the big cities, technical colleges are booming. This one, specializing in metallurgy, is in Shenyang, a city of four million. Chang Jijong grew up on a commune, and he's determined to find a better life in the city. When I see my friends and classmates back on the commune, I tell them about my life here, and they really envy me. The conditions here are better. Chang was a Communist Party member at 19. He's clearly ambitious. He tried without success for the university. So he enrolled in this college to be a technician in metallurgy. Chang was able to move from country to city and adjust his personal ambitions to fit in with national goals. 
Nevertheless, for about 24 million babies born during the past 12 months in China, geography, where they were born, will have a lot to do with their schooling and how they'll spend the rest of their lives. Does the leadership see a problem developing because of the education policy? The gap widening between mental and manual workers? There is no problem here. We will select the best students to go to college. After all, we cannot send the worst students to college. On the other hand, we will popularize education, raising everybody's level. For that reason, there will be no widening of any gap. The gap exists, I think. But uh, the problem, we have the problem, and you have too, I think. Uh, of course, we have a bigger population, and we have fewer universities than you have. So the problem is sharper in China, I think. But I, I believe we can manage it. The official line is that, in the long run, everyone's cultural level will rise as the country achieves its modernization goals. But what happens until that time? In a number of provinces, there are complaints about the new enrollment policy, passing marks that are too high, discrimination against the countryside, favoritism toward the key schools. If you were Chinese, would you feel that the current educational policies are unjust? That certain privileged people have the advantage of getting into better schools and getting better jobs? That the children of the countryside are being discriminated against? Or do you say, life is unfair? That China's practical needs require a compromise in ideology? that modernization is the highest order of politics, and it must be achieved, even if many individual ambitions can't be realized, even if there is a risk of creating an elitist group. An argument familiar to Americans because, in some ways, we're still struggling with it. For the Chinese, the choice, or lack of choice, is a fact of life. A personal note. I've talked about the openness of the Chinese today. This was my seventh trip there. Never on the previous visits have officials as well as ordinary people been so candid, so eager to talk about almost everything. Answering questions and asking them too. Questions about how much I earn. Questions about Carter, Nixon, normalization computers, cost of clothes, education, jobs, the future. All that doesn't mean, though, that the Chinese are becoming more like Americans. In many ways, their questions point up the difference between the two societies. For example, do you Americans ask permission to travel in your country? Or does your government assign jobs to people? Some of the people who are with us. Lynn Pin is a farmer's daughter who entered the university under the system used during the Cultural Revolution. After high school, she was required to work. She was later sent to university, chosen by the masses, in her case, the farmers, a group decision. She and her senior classmates had all been accepted without taking entrance exams, assigned to school by their work groups. After they're graduated, they won't be able to choose their jobs. The state will assign them where they're needed. Lynn Pin hopes to teach in her native province. She will only if the government agrees that she's needed there. Chang Jijiang, a farmer's son, entered college under the new system by passing an entrance exam. Still, his career will be determined by the state. 
An American his age can apply for any job, although there's no guarantee of work in the United States. For Chung, unemployment is no problem. The state and the Communist Party will see to his future. I'm a member of the Communist Party, and I'll obey any party assignment. So if the party assigns me to work in the countryside, I will contribute my knowledge to industry in the rural area. But is that what you really want to do? Well, if I had a choice and still obey party rules, I would rather make my contribution by working in a research institution. So the government is both the ultimate employer and employment agency. Every year it places millions of young people in factories, farms, higher education, the military as street sweepers, elevator operators, oil field workers. Assigning jobs for millions of people across an area as big as the United States requires a complex system. The key to that system is one of China's least known agencies, the State Planning Commission. With headquarters in Peking, it has branches countrywide at every administrative level. Together with other ministries, it figures out where workers are needed. Then, with the help of school administrators, it places graduates in jobs. A mechanic for an oil field, a translator in Canton, a metallurgist for a steel mill, a teacher in Mongolia, a farmer in Honan. The graduates go where they're sent. All citizens are expected to conform to the decisions of the leadership. Every institution is designed to support the system, including the schools. The entire country is continually acting out a morality play. The plot is constant. The current policy represents good, the bad is what is contrary to it. Then people are subtly prodded into what has been determined as the correct line. Everybody? No, not quite. There are complaints, sometimes loud ones, to newspapers, especially the People's Daily, to ministries at meetings, and increasingly on wall posters. Even Mao has been criticized in this way, something unthinkable before. Some economic policies are under fire and the new educational programs. All of it raising concern that the poster complaints could get out of hand and upset the stability that the modernization drive requires. Of course, this kind of phenomenon will take place. As Chairman Mao said, in our world, they will be the right, the left, and the middle. But our present policy has the support of the overwhelming majority of the people. Any policy, naturally, will meet resistance from a minority. That is not strange. But eventually, I think the minority will be proved wrong. But how big is that minority? Well, in a country of nearly a billion people, it could be sizable. Since the leadership change in 1976, many party members have been purged. Many Red Guards of the Cultural Revolution, now in their 20s and 30s, are out of the mainstream. Their kind of political idealism, out of fashion these days. Many of the educated youth exiled to the countryside are not happy with their fate. 
The prime mover in China's drive for modernization, senior Vice Premier Deng Xiaoping, has no time for revolutionary nostalgia. He's made modernization political dogma. Education, science, technology. Remove the rust from the economy. Too much to do. No time for empty political talk. All that is Deng Xiaoping, the dominant force in China. And the country seems to be responding to the momentum fired. That momentum has already tarnished the reputation of the Cultural Revolution. To the Mao is scaled down to human dimensions. Many things are changing in China. Chairman Mao's old idea of a people's war. Guerrilla warfare, surrounding the enemy in a sea of people. That's now regarded as outmoded. A military force outclassed by the Soviet Union, China's neighbor and arch rival. The toning down of the concept of equality is likely to become a sharp issue again. How will the peasants, China's largest group, react if the gap between city and country continues to widen. And the cities. In recent years, the centers of youthful political activity. If modernization runs into trouble, how will the politically aware city youth channel their energies? As China modernizes, its future will be determined partly by its relationship with the outside world. A relationship that's changing almost daily, becoming more open, at least to our part of the world. The changes have produced an optimism that has altered our perception of China in a very short time. China is already a political and strategic power. By the year 2000, it hopes to be an industrial power as well. If it doesn't succeed, there could be more internal turmoil, the kind that seriously damaged the Chinese educational process and created an isolationist, suspicious outlook toward the rest of the world. But if China succeeds, it will change not only the economy of Asia, but of the entire world. This generation of Chinese is trying to build the most powerful country in the world. Now open your books. Please open your books. The leadership is counting on a politically stable, well-educated, technologically sophisticated people. March. March. Strong. That's a lot to expect. And if what happened in the past 21 years is any guide, the Chinese should continue to expect only the unexpected in the next 21 years, up to the year 2000. As for ourselves, we should be reminded that in the year 2000, China's population will be five to six times bigger than ours. If China comes even close to its goals as an educated, technologically sophisticated nation, it will be a super, superpower in a class by itself. Now the bell is ringing. Class is over. Class is over. Goodbye, Harvard. Goodbye, teacher.